This is chapter 17. When Nick got home from school, he saw his father in the backyard throwing baseballs left-handed into the pitching net. Nick dropped his blazer on the chair, yanked off his necktie, and ran outside. How's your, you know, he pointed at his dad's bed banded shoulder. My stump, you mean? His father smiled ruefully. Actually, it's more like a stump of a stump, Nick thought. At least he hasn't lost his sense of humor. His dad said, the infection's almost gone, but I'd be lying if I said I didn't feel like a million bucks. Then you should take it easy. No, sir. Captain Gregory Waters grabbed another ball from the bucket by his feet. Take off your sling, Nicky, and we'll play some catch. Nick knew it was useless to argue. Throw it here, he said. Unstrap your right arm and go get your glove. Come on, Dad, just throw it. Suit yourself, his dad wound up and pitched. The ball made a smack when it landed in Nicky's bare hand and it stung. Whoa, Nick whistled and shook his fingers. That's pretty good. I'm getting there, his father said. Nick tossed back the ball, which was straight enough, went, which went straight enough, though not terribly hard. He still felt awkward throwing with the wrong arm. Dad, how long have you been out here practicing? Mm, four hours and some change. Geez, are you not tired? Greg Waters laughed. Are you kidding? I'm wiped, he said, but it's the best way to build up my strength and get some muscle memory. His next pitch was low and off mark. Nick scooped it off the grass, took a big step, and hurled it back five feet over his father's head. Greg Waters chuckled and said, even when I had two arms, I couldn't jump that high. Nick retrieved the baseball from the bed of the geraniums and jogged back to the end of, at other end of the yard. Who's your favorite lefty of all time, he asked his dad on the next throw. Steve Carlton of the Phillies, way before your time, but you shouldn't have seen his fastball. Better than Jonah Santana's? Ask me again when Jonah is in the Hall of Fame. He zipped another bun back at Nick, who didn't mind the sting. It was exciting to see his dad throwing so hard and accurately from, one, from what was once his weak side. So, Nicky, what's the hot news at Truman? Nick had planned to tell his parents about smoke at dinner. They would have heard about it eventually anyways. Libby's dad came to arrest a kid at school. Only the kid ran off into the woods and got away, Nick said. Greg Waters stopped in the middle of his pitching motion. He lowered his arm and hung on to the ball. What's he being arrested for? The fire in the swamp that I told you about. The day we went on the field trip, Nick said. But here's the thing, Dad. I don't think he did it. How do you know? The back door opened and Nick's mom came outside wearing a first baseman's mitt as big as a ham. She pounded a fist into the pocket and called out to Nicky's dad. Come on, soldier boy, let's see what you got. Greg Waters grinned and hurled the bar, which was snagged easily and threw underhanded, but with plenty of juice, to Nick. His mother hadn't played softball since college, but she still had an excellent arm. How long have you been home? Nick asked her. About 30 seconds. I saw you two rookies out here in the yard and figured you needed some backup or else you were gonna break some windows at Mr. Schnorter's house. Not me, Nick's father said, pretending to be insulted. Nicky's the wild one. For half an hour, they played three-way catch in a breezy, pleasant silence, just as they used to before Greg Waters had been sent to Iraq. To Nick, it seemed unreal that not even two weeks had passed since his dad had been seriously wounded. Yet he was already back home, slinging the baseball, it was like a miracle, Nick thought. Then again, his father was no ordinary patient. Greg Waters said, Nick, tell your mom what happened at school today. Oh, I already know about it. Gilda Carson text messaged every parent at the phone book. And Nick's mother, that boy who ran from the police. And the same one who stopped over last night to borrow Nick's biology book? Really? Nick didn't mention that. Greg Waters looked concerned, but he kept on throwing. His name is Dwayne Screw Jr., Nick's mother said. His dad did a stretch in jail for arson, so I guess the apple doesn't fall far from the tree. Mom, he didn't do it, Nick cut in firmly. What makes you so sure? He told me so, Nick said, while he was running away from Detective Marshall. He stopped me at lacrosse practice and said he was innocent. So why would he bother to do that if it weren't true? Nick's mother tossed him the baseball. 
People do lie, Nikki, especially when they're in trouble. But I believe him. You guys didn't see the look in his eyes, but I did. Nick heaved the ball to his dad, who bobbled it and then dropped in the grass. Obviously, he was distracted by what he was hearing. Nick's mom said, tell your father what the other kids called Dwayne Jr. Oh, it's just a nickname, Nick protested. Let's hear it, he said to his dad. Smoke, Nick said quietly, knowing it would be harder than ever to convince his parents that Dwayne screwed Jr. was innocent. Smoke, Greg Waters picked up the baseball and turned it over and over in his hand. Let me guess why they call him Smoke. Because that's what he likes to be called. Nobody knows why, Nick said. And then he added, Okay, the police said he had two fires a long time ago, but that doesn't automatically mean he did this one. Nick assumed that his mother had already learned about Smoke's previous arsons from Mrs. Carson, who probably got the information from Graham. Nicky, this doesn't sound good, his father said. But what happened in the past shouldn't matter. If he didn't start this fire, he shouldn't be arrested for it, Nick said. That's not right, Dad. Nick's mother walked over and put his arm around him, her softball mitt resting behind his back on the lump that he was wrapped up with his right arm. She said, According to Mrs. Carson, they've got a real strong evidence that Dwayne Jr. did it. Like what? She didn't say in the message, but she made it sound real solid. Nick pulled away and sat down in the patio chair. Well, I don't believe that. Anyways, they're supposed to be innocent till proven guilty, right? If Smoke was lying to me on the lacrosse field, Nick thought, then the kid is the world's greatest actor. Did the policeman catch him? He asked. Not yet, his mom said. I better go start dinner. We can talk about this later. Captain Gregory Waters sat down, flexing the fingers in his left hand. He looked sore and exhausted. Maybe tomorrow I'll try the fly rod, he said. Nick found himself staring at the empty right sleeve of his father's shirt. Getting used to the sight of him with one arm would take time. His dad even joked about how lopsided he appeared in the mirror. Can I ask you something about the war, Nick said? Sure. That man who died when the rocket hit your Humvee, you said he was like a brother to you. It's true, he was, Nick's father said. How long, do you know him? How long did you know him before then? Gregory Waters thought for a moment. Two weeks, maybe three. That's not a very long time, Nick said. Well, sometimes you make a connection right away. And not just because you're like in battle together. No, the same thing would have happened if I'd played ball with, in the minors, Nick's dad said. Nick's dad said Nick's dad. You start talking to a new player the first day of spring training and right away you know he's an okay guy. And then some other guy would walk up and in two seconds you could tell that he was a complete jerk. I know what you mean, Nick said. It's like a weird radar. Yeah, sort of. Nick stood up. I need to make a phone call before dinner. His father said, this boy the police are hunting for, is he a friend of yours? That's a good question, Nick said. I think maybe he is. After setting the table for his mom, Nick went to the bedroom, shut the door, and called Libby Marshall on her cell. She was out walking her dog, Sam. No, they didn't catch him yet, she said, anticipating Nick's question. But they will, and my dad is so not amused. He pulled a hamstring while trying to chase him. Nick had to be careful what he said to Libby. It was natural for her to believe what Smoke was guilty because that's what her father was telling her. Libby said, he's on probation for torching that torching that billboard on the interstate <clears throat> so they can lock him up until his next trial my dad says six months maybe longer no wonder he ran away nick thought are they still out there looking for him nah he's like a he's not like a serial killer libby said they'll bust him as soon as he goes home dad says that's where they usually find juvenile fugitives but what if he doesn't show up right nick where else is he gonna go I thought, I wish I knew. Why are they so sure he did it? Nick was hoping that Libby's father had mentioned something about the mysterious new evidence. And luckily he had. Somebody found Smoke's book bag near the place where the fire was started, Libby said. Guess, it was in, guess what was in it? A portable torch, just like the arsonist used. His toast, Nick. Case closed. His book bag from school? The camel one? Hang on a second, Libby said. Sam, no, bad dog, bad dog. While she hollered at her pet, Nick held the phone away from his ear. It didn't make sense that Smoke's backpack suddenly turned up in the black vine swamp. When Libby came back on the line, she was out of breath. Sorry, Nick, I gotta go. Sam's cornered a humongous tomcat, and he's about to scratch his nose off. 
No, bad boy, no, I said. Nick hung up immediately and called Marta. What are you doing first thing tomorrow? He asked. Sleeping, she said. It's Saturday, remember? Oh, we're going on a bike ride. I don't think so, Nick. Be ready at eight. Get serious, said Marta. I plan to be snoring like a polar bear at eight in the morning. No, this is important and I'll explain to you everything when I see you. Don't you dare take me back to Mrs. Starch's house. I don't want to end up with glass eyeballs and a tag around my neck like all those other dead animals. Nick said, don't worry, that's not where we're going. <clears throat> the next morning, Dwayne Scrooge Sr. crept into the kitchen to get some sunflower seeds for Nadine. He heard a knock at the front door and then a voice calling, Dwayne, are you there? It sounded too young to be an FBI man, but Dwayne Scrooge Sr. wasn't taking any chances. He scrambled back to the music room and barricaded himself. His macaw, who was famished, previously latched onto one of his earlobes. Yet Dwayne Scrooge Sr. gritted his teeth and remained silent in spite of the pain. He didn't want to go back to jail, although he realized that the odds were stacked against him. Attacking the tax man wasn't the brightest move he had ever made. He figured it was only a matter of time before his house was surrounded with heavily armed agents from the U.S. government. Earlier in the day, Dwayne Scrooge Sr. had hid him from another stranger, a man who knocked repeatedly repeatedly and identified himself as the sheriff deputy searching for Junior Dwayne Jr. Dwayne Sr. had snatched Nadine from her cage and ran to cower under a quilt in the music room. Dwayne, open up. It's me, Nick Waters, the new visitor shouted. Then a girl's voice said, I told you so. He's not here. It occurred to Dwayne Scrooge Sr. that the persons on the porch might actually be looking for his son, but he quickly dismissed that idea. Except for one or two Mosquito Indians, Junior didn't have any friends his own age. No, thought Dwayne Sr. Senior, this must be a trap. The FBI could be extremely sneaky. As soon as the voices outside stopped, Nadine let go of Dwayne Scrooge Senior's ear. After a few minutes, he cautiously approached the small spinet piano that was blocking the music room and prepared to push it aside. Hush up, bird, Dwayne Scrooge Senior whispered, or I'll sell you to the Colonel Sanders. A female voice from behind piped up. Don't do that. Dwayne Scrooge Sr. wheeled around and cowered beside the piano. Framed in the open window were two faces, a boy and a girl watching him. What do you want, he demanded. Did the government send you? The boy said, we go to school, Dwayne. We need to find him. Yeah, well, get in line. He's in our biology class, the girl said. Nadine screeched and flapped around the room two to three times before landing on a dusty chandelier. Go away, Dwayne Scrooge Sr. barked at the kids. He still wasn't convinced that they were not FBI agents in disguise. The boy said, Dwayne's running from the police. They're going to arrest him for arson, but we don't think he did it. No, Nick, the girl interrupted. You don't think he did it. Whatever, we got to talk to him. Dwayne Scrooge Sr. said, even if I knew where he was, which I don't, I wouldn't tell you. So kindly take a hike, and I mean now. But the two kids didn't move. What's wrong with the world, thought Dwayne Scrooge Sr. When, the grown when did the grown-ups quit being in charge? That's a nice piano, the girl said. I've been taking lessons since I was four. How thrilling for you, Dwayne Scrooge Sr. grumbled. Now get lost. He was astounded to see both kids calmly climb right through his window and enter the room. The girl said, you know, I played what I played. In the fall recital, I played Rangement off Prelude, number four in D. You're kidding, Dwayne Scrooge Sr. said. That's one of my all-time favorites. He slid the spinet away from the door, and the girl sat down on the piano bench and played the whole piece from memory. Now that's downright lovely, Dwayne Scrooge Sr. admitted. She said, my name's Marta, and this is Nick. Dwayne, I'm Dwayne's dad, and I still can't tell you where he's at because I don't have a clue. Besides, you might be undercover FBI, the girl said. Now, that's the dumbest thing I've ever heard. I didn't even make the JV cheerleading squad, Dwayne Scrooge Sr. reddened. The boy named Nick said, didn't you hear what happened at school yesterday? Nope, Junior never came home is all I know. That's because he's a fugitive from justice, the girl named Marta said dramatically. Oh, that's great, Dwayne Scrooge Sr. muttered. The boy described what had occurred at the sheriff's when the sheriff's detective went to Truman, to Truman School to arrest Dwayne Jr. for the arson of the Black Vine Swamp. But DJ said that he didn't have 
any ev- but DJ said they didn't have any evidence. He promised me, said his father. They didn't have a thing until yesterday, said the boy named Nick, and then they found his book bag at the scene of the fire. Now Dwayne Scrooge Sr. was really puzzled. DJ has a book bag? The girl sighed. For school, Mr. Scrooge. It was camel colored, the kid said. Nick went on. It's like a hunter's backpack. Okay, yeah. Now Dwayne Scrooge Sr. remembered the bag. When was the last time you saw it, the boy said. Day before yesterday. The two kids whispered to each other and the girl tuned, turned to Dwayne Scrooge Sr. and said, are you 100% sure? You bet I am. It was when that government tax man was here, violating my personal property. He grabbed Junior's bag off the floor and tried to murder my sweet dear Nadine with it. Ain't that right, darling? <clears throat> so where's the backpack now, the girl asked. Beats me, maybe the tax guy ran off with it. Dwayne Scrooge Sr. wondered how long he could put off calling Melissant Winship to tell her that her grandson is in real trouble with the law again. The boy named Nick said, I don't think Dwayne is guilty. Dwayne Scrooge Sr. coughed. I'd dearly like to believe that's true, but DJ's got what they call a history with fire. Well, this time he didn't do it, declared the boy. That's what he told me, and I believe him. So what you expect me to do, go march to the courthouse, Dwayne Scrooge Sr. shrugged. Junior won't come out of the woods till he's good and ready, and they'll never find him out there, not a trillion years. When you hear from him, who says I will? If you do, the girl named Marta says, tell him to quit running and turn himself in. It's the only way we're going to be able to clear his name. Dwayne Scrooge Sr. cackled bitterly. This ain't the movies, you know. Life doesn't shake down so simple. The boy went out the window first. The girl followed, pausing briefly on the sill. And she said, that's a sweet little piano. Do you play? Smoke's father shook his head. Not in years. Well, you should take it up again. Yeah, what for? Because you'll feel better, the girl said and dropped out of sight. On the ride home, Nick was so agitated he had trouble keeping his bike on the sidewalk. Don't you see? It's a total setup, he explained to Marta. Smoke couldn't possibly have ditched his book bag in the swamp on the day of the fire because his father saw the same bag in his house two days ago. You know what? I remember seeing it in her Smoke's desk in biology class the first day Waxmo was there. Marta said, easy, dude. You're going to hyperventilate. I'm serious. Somebody stole that backpack, stashed a torch in it, and left it at the scene of the arson. Smoke's being framed. But why? That's crazy. Nick had to agree. Some vital pieces of the puzzle were missing. Although Dwayne Scrooge Jr. kept himself at Truman, he didn't seem to have made any enemies. Nick couldn't think of a single person who he'd want to see the kid wrongfully locked up in jail. Don't forget, Marta said, the guy's dad is a major screwball. I mean, come on, why would my tax dollar, why would a tax collector steal a kid's book bag? What if he wasn't really a tax collector, Nick said. What if he went to Smoke's house just to take something that he could plant at the Black Vine Swamp, something incriminating? Marta gave a skeptical grunt. Now don't get mad, she said, but here's another what if. Okay, what if Smoke had two book bags, Nick? One for his school stuff and one for his pyro gear. Nick was growing frustrated with Marta. Why couldn't she see what was happening? But he came over Thursday night to borrow my biology book, remember? He said he lost his backpack. I told you about it the next day. He also said he needed to study for a non-existent exam, Marta pointed out. The whole story is really sketchy. You said so yourself. Nick broke, braked his bike under the shade of the tree and tried to gather his thoughts. Nothing about this fire in the Black Vine Swamp made much sense. From the disappearance to Mrs. Starch, Mrs. Starch to the appearance of Dwayne Scrooge Jr.'s backpack. Marta stopped her bicycle besides Nick's. What if Smoke heard his book bag had been found where the fire was set? And what if he was trying to make an alibi for himself by coming over and telling you that he'd, quote, lost it? Then he gets his dad to lie and say the bag was in the house two days ago and some stranger conveniently ripped it off. Nick said, I like my theory better. If he's not guilty, why'd he run from Libby's dad? because he was scared to get arrested. He's freaked out, that's all. Marta said, everybody says they're innocent, no matter what. Don't you watch court TV? To himself, Nick admitted that it was possible that she was right and that Smoke was playing him for a sucker. But Nick's father always said to go with your gut and Nick's gut said this kid is telling the truth. Marta, I still say he didn't do it. Fine, then you tell me one good reason 
why anyone in town would want to frame him. Name one person. He wasn't listening. He had gotten off his bike and started jogging across the street. Come on, he called back. Are you cracking up or what? She shouted. Hurry, Nick motioned excitedly toward the strip mall. Marta hastily locked both bikes up to the tree and ran after him. Mrs. Starcher's Prius with the Save the Manatees license plate was parked outside the pizza joint called Little Napolia, and the car was empty and unlocked. Nick checked around to make sure nobody was watching, and then he dove into the back seat, leaving the door open for Marta. What are you doing? She demanded anxiously, looking over her shoulder. Waiting for that Twilly guy, or whoever he says, or whoever that was driving. Get in. But he said he never wanted to lay eyes on us again. Did you forget? Nick had it forgotten, he said. This is the only way I'm going to get some answers, and I don't know about you, but I'm tired of being confused. Marta grimaced and clutched the sides of her head. Are you completely, totally, hopelessly nuts? I'd rather be confused than dead. That guy had bullets on his belt, Nick. Real, live bullets, which means he probably has a real, live gun to put them in. I'm not moving, Nick said flatly. Either you go home or you get in the car with me. But you better make up your mind because here he comes. And Marta got in the car. End of chapter 17.